Oh, and this is all your stuff. Oh, thank you. Anyone, if you, does everybody need a few minutes to take a look at them or? If anybody's relying on the screen that's up, let me know and I and you need me to show you the next, next page or scroll down, just please tell me. Do we have a motion to accept the board minutes? Okay, so move. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mitchell statement. I'll put that on the screen. This is a reminder, although it's February, we always look at the prior month statement. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just kind of looking at what I have here. And I, there's nothing unusual or weird as you, I mean, always what you're gonna see is that the biggest expenditures are payroll. Um, everything else is quite incidental. Um, another regular bill, of course, that we have is gasoline for the van. That's the most regular and staples we, we order office supplies. So you'll see those line items have some activity from month to month. Um, I will note that, so we're doing well with the gifts and donations fund. As always, we kind of keep pace with the money that we take in um, for class fees um, and money that's outgoing to pay instructors. So we, we strive to maintain a balance there and it works quite well. And what you don't see the detail here, but we are, I did make a, larger than usual expenditure out of that account, which is not our general town's budget, but this is, you know, the gifts and donations um, account. Um, and I've, I've purchased, um, well, my, st my staff and I um, are, to, and some other town, and, and a, another town employee, and in fact, an, and a member of our age and dementia friendly working group, Amy Fiden, are going to be taking CPR and first aid. So I paid for it. That's going to be, we're doing a half day class on that next week. And I paid for that out of gifts and donations. It was a little over $700. But it's a, something that we need to keep up with. I think it's every two years that we need to re-up re that. Um, so that's the only kind of unusual, larger than normal expense that you would see here. But Happy to entertain any questions you might have. And I want to point out too, if you're looking at this and you're looking at um, 
the salary lines, like program coordinator is Violet, and it's important for you to know that the town pays the, the amount indicated here, 26102 but the, that's not all she makes. Um, the, the EOEA grant, the grant we receive yearly from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs is what we rely on to, to, um, to add to her salary. So an additional $16,668 is, um, is allocated to her salary. Um, I wouldn't want you to think that Violet's limping along on that. <laughs> wouldn't be fair. But she's the only staff member right now that receives any kind of um, that has, you know, that her, whose salary is split between the town budget and a grant. <clears throat> um, but we might see that in the future. For example, I am requesting for the next budget round that um, for FY24 um, that our administrative assistant role is increased to 25 hours a week. And um, one reason why I'm arguing that we can afford it is that we we got that increase in our executive office bill, in our EOEA grant um, from $16,668 to, I think, over $24,000. So that's, to, in my mind, that is a cushion that um, enables, should enable the town to um, increase her salary and make her benefited only insofar as she would be getting paid days off when needed for being ill or vacation, which I think is deserved of anyone in the role. When would that be decided? It will be decided by, um, it will be decided at town meeting. Annual town meeting in May is when everyone, um, all the voters present vote on the budgets. Um, but the, the town administrator's recommendation will be going out, you know, prior to that. And we've already been, all the department heads in the town have been meeting with her with our proposed budgets and having conversations. And um, I'm supposed to present our budget and um, after I see what her recommendations are, which I haven't yet, but I will Thursday evening, um, the finance committee will meet and that will be our opportunity to talk more about the budget. That's hopefully I'm, I'm on board with, um, that the town administrator and treasurer and I are all in agreement with, but I am still waiting to see, uh, their recommendation. Are there any more questions about the financial statement? We have a motion to accept the financial statement. I make a motion. We accept the financial statement. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Building us to go. There isn't. So Jane would normally give that. I did just. She she needed to be in town hall, and so I just said, "Hey, what's going on with the solar RFP?" <laughs> And it's not up yet because, and the delay is frustrating, um, but they are waiting for specific language from the company that makes the fasteners that would be fastening the solar array to the existing roof. Um, so they need to just make sure, I think this is a due diligence uh, move in order to make sure that anyone bidding on the project knows exactly the kind of roof we have, exactly the kind of fasteners that would be needed, and every detail that anyone would, you know, in the in the industry would need to be able to make an intelligent guess as to how much it would cost them to do the job. So um, I'm sure it is necessary. It's just it is taking quite a while to get the necessary data to put out a really thorough and well researched RFP. So it's still in process. I still believe it'll happen, but it's not yet public and ready to go. Other than that, I don't think I have any building updates. I will, I'll remind you that we are getting our windows washed in the spring as a donation that, and the friends are financing that and it's over, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars, windows inside and out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I am beginning to see, and I'm sure you will too, if you take a close look, you know, the residue, especially on this wall facing mm -hmm. north, um, you know, there's some soil buildup and it's just beginning to look not as good as it did when they were clean and brand new. So it's time and I'll be excited about that and very grateful for the friends for financing that because we do not have a, a town maintenance budget that's covering um, external maintenance of the buildings right now, which is something that we hope changes. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we're grateful that the friends can 
can handle that and help. Do they wash the screens too? That's a great question. I don't know if that was included in the estimate, but I'll ask, I'll ask Jane. Screens too? <laughs> Um, and yeah, I don't think that there's no, no major things malfunctioning, no repairs. So I don't think that there are any other, you know, it's really the big item is the solar roof and we just have faith that that'll happen. Do we know how many panels we're going to need for solar? Somebody knows that, but I don't. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I uh, make a point of having some additional detail about that project that gives you some more physical specifics to, to think about um, for the next time. Okay. What, what about, is, that, is the building, you know, dirty on that side? Will it need to be power washed or anything? Well, the building, I think that the what I've been told is that the kind of soil that's building up on this side of the building isn't really gonna be, it, it needs more, it needs to be scrubbed and a power wash isn't really gonna do it. So that's not included in the window estimate. We did earlier, a community member stepped forward and said that he would do it mm -hmm. as a volunteer. That hasn't happened and I have not pressed him because it was a kind offer and I don't, and I'm, it feels awkward to say, hey, by the way, you know, you said you were gonna hand clean the whole building. Are you gonna do, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if that will happen and, um, but I would be just glad for the windows to be done because I think that's the the most the biggest detractor when you're in here. Let's see. Um, so next on the agenda, uh, Linda Leduc as our um, Highland Valley Elder Services liaison. I wondered if you would give us an you know your monthly update on how things are going with Highland Valley. Um, I've had a couple of meetings with, first of all, the board meeting, which there was really nothing new to report. Mm -hmm. um, the nutrition meeting, that's the council that I'm on, um, met. And basically that committee reviews the feedback from surveys <laughs> that they do on the meals. And mm -hmm. 700 to 800 meals a day. And what they do is ask people, what did you like the best? What tasted the best to you? What didn't you like and why? And then during the meeting, they go over the survey results. Mm -hmm. um, the survey results so far seem to be mainly on taste. And um, people will comment on quality and texture, but it's mostly what tastes good. And um, not really... I mean, the complexities of looking at nutrition for volume like that are, you know, it's difficult for them, but they, the feedback is not, their focus is not so much on the nutrition of each meal. Right. They are aware that a lot of them are high sodium, um, but with what they're using for product, that's difficult to deal with so far. They... They have the feedback. They know what they need to do. It's a question of how would they be able to do it. Like, and afford doing it? Afford doing it. Right. And I also, think, oh, sorry. The other thing was the plastic, okay. plastic bylaw. Right. Um, Jane Nevin Smith thought that they might be affected negatively by that plastic bylaw because they have to deliver the meals in their takeaway box. Right. You know? Aren't recyclable. Right. So um, I talked with Alan. We met from Holland Valley and Jane and somebody else I forget. Anyway, um, it looks like they may be exempt. They're probably exempt from Yeah, that. I thought so. Because the food for uh, exempt number four exempts um, nonprofits who make food outside Hadley and deliver it to Hadley. And it's prepared for Hadley people, and Hadley people eat it, but it isn't prepared or packaged in Hadley. So it looks like it, like we would not have, we wouldn't have to change our meeting style to, yeah. to trays being brought in and buffet kind of family. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't think that's going to happen. So it looks like it'll be status quo. Okay, thank you. And and things thank can change, but right. And thanks again for being in this role and. Um, 
representing the interests of Hadley older adults at these meetings. I really do appreciate it. And I think it's good insight that we receive and hopefully that they receive when you share I, I what you know about the meeting. It was mentioned they were going to go to a different food, um, Cisco or something different. Uh, they're, they are more and more, um, they're moving as much as they can away from the bulk product, which comes, I believe, from the state. Okay. Um, I don't have surplus any, food? The surplus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're only like a third using that now. And I think, from what I understood, that's what's boosting the sodium up. Mm -hmm. Probably. So they are trying to find, I have it written in my notes from last, from the yeah. age-friendly meeting, but I didn't bring them here. But they are trying to move toward uh, fresher produce, local produce, and um, and a better source mm -hmm. of food. So, but it's going to take time. Sure. Yeah. I'm intrigued. Uh, you said most of the survey was, uh, complaints dealt with taste. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with taste? One thing that occurs to me, maybe you put more salt in it yeah. that we all yeah. agree well, people, there's already too much salt. In yeah. People would say things like it was too sweet or too salty or yeah. too sour or the texture wasn't pleasant. You know, or it was too watery. So those kinds of yeah. things attached to taste. I suppose going from bulk to uh, more fresh stuff would would be very helpful in that regard. But they're trying to substitute more fresh for desserts, which I think is a good idea because the desserts are kind of not diabetic friendly. In fact, they don't really have. I think there are only two or three months or meals a month that I thought were really diabetic friendly. I think the volume, well, they, they have they know they have work to do. Yeah, it's complicated, and they do provide hundreds of yeah, meals, hundred plus a day. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if the foods that people like are the ones with the most sodium. <laughs> That's what I'd like best. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say. Couldn't say. You know, it's perfectly possible to cook with less sodium and still have foods taste delicious. So. That's true. And it's a learning process, too, about how do you mm -hmm. enhance flavor and not lean on salt. And they don't count protein. They count carbs and sodium and a couple other things, but they don't count protein, which for a lot of seniors who have kidney disease or just aging kidneys, um, that's important not to have high protein meals or high meat protein meals. So that's something they have to work on. And also fats, you mm -hmm. know, um, healthy fats rather than fat fats. There's a lot they need to work on. They are, uh, they're proud of what they're doing so far and, and know they have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to let you all know that starting soon, starting this month, and I think, let's see, when is day one? It will be, well, I think it's starting this week. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, interns from UMass School, um, the Elaine Marie School of Nursing will be here. Um, two interns, they're undergraduates, but they're seniors. They'll be graduating in May, and they will be in the building. Um, kind of placed they might be you know last year they the interns were in here most of the time but you know things shift according to need they'll be flexible um they'll also be using the nurse's office um and and, and other spaces and they will also be interacting with um visitors here but it's they they're starting here on <sighs> thursday and they will be here every thursday until um until their final week, which is um, May 4th. And that's a day that we are planning to schedule a health fair. You might, some of you might remember that we had a really robust mm -hmm. health fair last year and it was the first, it had been an annual event until COVID. And so we had to skip a couple of years, but then um, I thought it would be a good project for the nursing interns to put it together and to do all the communicating with the various agencies and, and vendors and relevant people provide, you know, providers in the area to come, and it went really well, and it was well attended, so um, we're going to have them do that again this year. 
And so that health fair will be in May and that will be their kind of capstone experience here. Um, they will also do another nutrition program and a cooking demonstration like they did last year. And that they're going to have, um, they will also be doing a dementia friend training in person here on um, March 9th. So that's a Thursday. So I just want you to be aware of that. If you would like to be trained in person by and support these nursing interns in the work they're doing here and be trained as a dementia friend, this is something that we did last year too. Um, I think that that will be an interesting, you know, relevant experience and will should also hopefully dovetail with our plan um, to continue working on um, initiating um, a friendly visiting companion program that I mentioned last time. And um, Linda can perhaps share more about the work she's been doing to research existing models in our area. And, you know, right now we're just envisioning training some volunteers to do friendly visiting um, with with people who might want it and training those people to have to be also be dementia friends and you can get dementia friend training in other ways you don't need to attend this one specific training that these nursing intern students will offer um, it could happen sooner than that i'm pretty sure and it can be done online um, but at any rate those are the ideas that we developed to to utilize the the time and skills of these students. And um, I thought it worked really well to have students here last year. And it's, you know, kind of intergenerational. I mean, it is. They're definitely not the generation of the of visitors to the senior center. And I think it introduces them in a really pleasant environment to um, the population of people over 60. And some of the, um, you know, the, the whole spectrum of experiences that we see. Um, so I'm I'm really happy to have them again. And I've really enjoyed working with their professor and the leader of their program, Dr. Sheila Pinnell, who happens to be a member of our Age and Dementia Friendly Working Group as well. And she's really stayed in tune with us and um, is supportive. As I said, you know, not only is she the teacher of these students and, you know, but she is accessible and helpful to us all year. Um, so that's that's great. So it's nice to continue to foster that relationship and be able to have a mutually beneficial situation um, and, and have a relationship with students at UMass. These uh, student interns, you said that you mentioned dementia training, which is only one activity, right? It's not the whole. No, their whole program. focus is not that. And are they going to be here like, every Thursday? All day? Yeah, they'll be here all day, every Thursday, and they will have some open hours. And is the hours. town nurse here then or not? They won't be interact. They The town nurse, um, that was my next agenda item. They won't be here at the same time as she is. Okay. But I hope they meet each other and they might find some synergy or some way to connect and amplify each other in some way. I don't know exactly how. So they'll be here kind of available on a walk-in basis for a variety of Yes, they will. People who want to talk to somebody with nursing mm -hmm. skills. Yeah, they'll have some ask the nurse hours. Yeah, and if they, uh, if they, they were interns, so they don't know everything, and, uh, and, and is is there some way that they are able to uh, get advice from uh, somebody else when they can't handle something? Well, their teacher Sheila. She'll be, be here. She won't be here. Well, she won't be here sometimes, but she would be available if they encountered a complicated question that they needed guidance with, and I, they might, and then they might be able to give advice to whomever they spoke with about good questions to ask their doctor or ways to follow up that would with their primary care um, provider that would make sense given what they're talking about. But they, because they're under the guidance of Sheila, I feel assured that they won't give misinformation and that they'll ask for help when they need it. Yep. And they are seniors, so they will be, you know, graduating and working in the field soon. So they've got training, you know, under their belts. Um, 
And that brings me to the fact that we have a new town nurse that was hired by the Board of Health, Roxanne Dunn. Um, she's the, I think, the head nurse of emergency of ER services at um, the Bay State facility in Greenfield. And she's going to be keeping that job. So she's someone who has definite um, intense experience and, you know, chops. And so she will be having regular office hours here using the nurse's office three to seven on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I'm going to mention her phone number in case we do have a listening audience. Um, it's our phone number, 586-4023, extension four. That would get you to her phone and she will be listening to voicemails and people, she'll be available on a walk-in basis, but people would also be able to make appointments. In the past, when Marge Bernard was our nurse, I know that she did regular blood pressure readings for people. She also administered B12 injections, and I'm pretty sure, and I really believe that Roxanne can do the same. And we'll learn more over time. And Roxanne has a particular interest. We talked in public health, and we've talked about her even doing public health programming, and she's going to be here those evenings. We're open late, so we might be able to have some presentations or some programs that touch upon relevant public health issues that she might um, feel like she wants to convey to the public. Um, and they could be open for all ages. We certainly don't need to limit it to older adults. Um, so I'm excited to see how this next chapter unfolds and how um, Roxanne learns to interact with our community. And um, I welcome all your ideas. And if you are feeling like there are different things she could do to make herself more known and accessible, and we can, and if there are ways to get the word out more effectively, it'll be in our newsletter. Um, you know, we do post things around the building. Um, we could, I think, probably a press release. Linda, a press release about our new nurse, I think, might be really great. Um, so there are, this is something that should be known. So I would gladly um, take thoughts on how to make it more known to the public. Um, in fact, Hadley Media might be able to, you know, create a slide or even do a little short interview with her. And just introduce her to the community. Will she start today? She started last week and she will be here oh. today. Yeah. 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 She can work with I'll, I'll do something if she wants to. Okay, super. Um, so that's great. We, you know, our, our resources are growing all the time, and the people who are involved with us, that number is growing all the time. Um, so the tax aid program, which I know you you're you're aware that we've been um, taking names and scheduling people's times to drop off their taxes. And this will be the third year in a row that they've been done in this building. Um, that's how that begins tomorrow. And so we have, I think, 61 people enrolled so far. The, the group of volunteers are going to be doing their work in the creativity room this, this year. That's a little different in the past. They've been in here. But they'll continue to meet their clients out in the dining room for their sort of final sign off. So for any of you who don't really know the structure of the way it works is that clients have packets. All the packets are available. They pick them up. Um, the packets are what they, you know, they turn in the packets with a lot of their documents, including last year's taxes, either the day of their, the, the time that their theirs are being prepared or the day before. We have a locked drop box. I grab the stack. I give them to the volunteers on the days that they're here. They'll be here alternate Wednesdays between tomorrow and April 12th. And then at the end, and then they and clients agree to be available by phone in case there are questions. And of course, there always are. And I and they I give a phone to one of our phones. I plug into the room where they are so that they are able to take phone calls and they're not using their personal phones to do this. And then at the end of the day, people are summoned to pick up their packets and sign, and they must sign in order for them to be filed electronically. So that's how it works. So just one thing to say is do expect, you know, kind of more comings and goings from people who aren't, you know, the, the usual visitors that you see. And there are people from all, you know, towns all over. Um, there any a resident from any town in North, and there isn't an age restriction either. You'll see younger people um, can have this done for free. So it's a really great service and it'll just, you know, there'll be just another layer of folks coming in and out and probably asking questions and what, you know, um, 
needing to be directed to, yeah, have a seat in the dining room and they'll be right with you. And, uh, you know, there's just going to be enhanced hosting needs on behalf of staff. Um, Is this still a service for the whole? Uh, will other senior centers be having tax aid programs? Other senior centers do. Yeah, Amherst does it. And I think South Hadley does it. And probably, I don't know about Northampton. I would imagine they would. <laughs> You'd think, but they, you know, with COVID, they didn't, um, wow. you know, it, it, so um, I'm not 100% sure that, they, I'm not sure at all that they are, I haven't asked, but other towns do do this. But you mentioned Amherst and South Adelaide, and so. I know that they're doing it. Yeah, so uh, Leverett, and I'm trying to think of other, <laughs> Shootsbury, places like that. They come. They come here. Actually, yeah. you know, we do. We do serve people from out of town, and we serve several people from Amherst who, for every reason, want to do it here. Well, at one time, didn't we do it in place of Amherst? Uh, we may have. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Uh huh. But like Shine, probably in the worst year of COVID. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I think that rings a bell, Dave. But I don't remember exactly. Um. But at any rate, we don't exclude anyone or reject them on the basis of them not being from Hadley. Yeah. So we don't really, you know. How many do we do roughly every year? Uh, well, last year, I think we did not a whole lot, like 40. Oh. But this year, we already have 60 people okay. enrolled. Good. And they can handle about 20 a day. With in a, How many a day they do depends on how many volunteers Pat is able to recruit and train. So... You know, usually it takes a while for us to know how many in a day they're going to be able to do. But at any rate, this year it's 20. And this whole process, I mean, this has been going, the organizational part, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The, the face of the iceberg has been, in you know, in the works for months, really, um, organizing this. It is a big, it is a big program, but it has such a huge positive impact for people to get their taxes done for free. I mean, it's hun saves them, I'd say, a minimum of $300. I, I was asked the other day as to whether or not there are any restrictions on the size of the return. And yeah. I said, I can't answer. I don't know. Meaning, like, some, the size of the return. Yeah, the size of the... Which they the, expect to get the, back? Uh, income or I don't complications. Like complications don't matter, and, yeah. I, I can't describe the parameters of what they can and can't take on, to be honest, but they they can't do it all. Um, yeah. But if but we do have a set of guidelines that I think describes um, that. And I, I take questions, and if anyone wonders about that and wants like a solid answer, I will convey the questions they have about their specific situation to Pat McCabe, who is the coordinator of the program. I never give his number, but I am. I do act as a, um, you know, a middle person in asking him questions and have done so frequently. So if anyone kind of wonders, oh, I might have a slightly complicated situation, will you really do mine? I can get those questions to Pat. And there's still time to, to sign up. It's not too late. The window isn't shut. We There are, you know, days later in this tax season that there are plenty of openings. There are plenty of openings. So people are still welcome to enroll. Yeah, I, I worked in that program years ago. It's been a long time now, and I can't remember exactly how we uh, described it, but certainly if people, for example, are running a business. Right. Uh, okay. That That is not, not able to be. Yeah. yeah. And some states, so people living in some states that aren't Massachusetts can mm -hmm. get their return done here, but not all. And yeah. so that's something that I always ask Pat. The computer software at the time I worked in, in any way, was capable of doing any kind. But it was, mm -hmm. the, it was the training of the people right. who were volunteering. That, and and the time available, too. Right. And I think we scheduled it. That was back when people would be sitting with you while you were doing their taxes. Mm -hmm. I think we scheduled them one every hour or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they, it seems like all the volunteers now divide the, the stack of their packets and just yeah. take whatever they think they can get through. 
Um, but it, and it's the new format does continue to work. Um, I'm not sure they'll ever, and I now wonder if they'll ever go back to the one-on-one -on -one appointments as opposed to drop off your packet, get a, you'll get a phone call if we have a question. And then it seems to me that that's probably easier for the, for the tax volunteers to do than and scheduling the rigid appointments. I bet it's pretty efficient too, because if you get in a conversation with someone, it can go off and to take, oh, yes. and take more time. You're, you're totally right. So I think this format might be here to stay, would be my guess. And it does work. I mean, it, it is effective. People get their taxes done <laughs> and they and they feel satisfied. Do, do people ever make a donation for that service or not? Um, if they did, they would probably, I mean... So we go to no, AARP. They might want to make one to the AARP, which is the yeah the sponsoring agency. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't believe I've received a donation from a, a client because of tax because they were grateful for having their taxes done here. Not to, not in my memory. Not impossible, but I just don't recall. They it's, could. I mean, it would be a nice thing to do, but it's I don't expect AARP it. Foundation. Ah, ah, thank you for the distinction. Uh, an associate of yes, a, right, a, 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 yeah, indeed. Yeah. Thank you. I will write that down because I don't want to forget that. Good point. Um. Oh, so I I have on our agenda going over programming coming up in February and March, and I'm gonna. I don't have a March calendar because it's being worked on right now march is i will just so i'm going to just focus on february but i will tell you that march is going to be really busy and you know and include things like a corned beef dinner for the lunch and violet is working on putting together a day trip to the mount folio greenhouses um with time to have lunch at the student center nice um so that'll be really nice to see their bulb show so she's working out that and there are you know, it's going to be an unusually dense month with programming, like even more so than it's been. So just stay tuned for that. So the new the new newsletter will include calendars for activities in March and April. And now let me just take a look at February. Um, and as a reminder, our, our newsletter is always, we always publish it in its lovely full color in on our website. So if you ever you misplace yours, you can always, and we, we print the, in the, well, print the, in preparing that publication, the calendar pages are last. That's January. So when, so February. Okay. Let's see what's coming up. It's colorful. Yeah. So it's really different color, right? Just a reminder that next Monday is President's Day and we will be closed. Um, Jane and I'm, I'm highlighting this trivia. Um, I don't know if any of you spend time with your grandchildren over school vacation. That's also the week of school vacation. But if you wanted to bring, if you might have young people in your care, at that time and want to bring them into some um, pre president's trivia to be facilitated by Jane Nevin Smith and Sharon Howard, you can know that that will be a fun time. Um, that's happening. Let's see. Um, this week we've got Coffee with a Cop on Thursday. That's always really popular. And Highland Valley, we have a lunch and learn. And, you know, the lunch and learn format is something that Violet has developed over time where she will, you know, make a sort of a a light but healthy and delicious because she's cooking at lunch to a company presentation. She's sweetening the deal. So if learning hurts you, but eating makes it more fun, you know, think about it that way. So the lunch and learn that's happening on this Friday is um, presented by some staff members from Highland Valley Elder Services talking about shopping on a budget. So that might be interesting if you're looking for some tips to shave off, you know, to, to spend less money shopping and just know that Violet will also be um, preparing a lunch. Uh, we have had a really wonderful, so a four part um, art series taught by a new 
new to us art instructor. Her name is Sarah Gately. And this week and next week are the, the last two in her series, Surrealism and Still Life. And people have been doing unusual and fun work with in that class. That's been really interesting to see. And please, and this, here's something a little different too. For our birthday ice cream social, and these always happen on the last Friday of the month, we don't always have entertainment, but for the next several months we do, starting next week, next Friday, um, the Fiddle Orchestra of Western Mass, um, which has been practicing here on Thursday nights um, since we, almost pretty much since we had evening hours, they will be doing a complimentary concert for us. So I think that's going to be extra special and fun. And I've been hearing them every week because Thursday night's my night to be here until seven. And I I really do enjoy them and feel confident that they, it'll be really enjoyable concert and fun way to gather with friends. Um, Us and them. This I don't know. I wish I understood what that means. Um, I'm going to look. So net, so Tuesday, the 28th, there's another lunch and learn. And it's a little cryptic on in the calendar. Let me see if I can find a description of what it is. Okay, here they are. Um, oh, wow. Oh, the Springfield Museum is going to be doing a presentation um, on dis- discrimination in general and yeah, during the Holocaust and now. So that will be that'll be a really interesting, compelling talk. And I would guess that there will bring some um, artwork to sh- to show as well to amplify their points. Um, and the previous Wednesday, the previous week, next week, there will be a, a funeral planning lunch and learn. So we, you know, we do always um try to get try to plan different educational presentations and gatherings um i like the title of that funeral planning for those who don't (laughs) plan to die yeah i think it really rings true for most people um but yeah this is why it makes sense to start talking about it even when you're feeling like that, is in the distant future. That's the time when it feels less painful to talk about it. Um, So those are things coming up in February. As I said, I don't have the March calendar handy, but please just know that, I mean, there's always just so much going on and um, we try to get the word out in lots of ways. Um, All right. The February calendars, in case that's what it is. All right, now I'm going to take a look at our, so something that I had to do this week was prepare an annual report for the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, and that's a yearly responsibility that I have, and and so it, it's always interesting to, to see kind of a whole fiscal year at a glance and look at the numbers, but they're not honestly as meaningful to me as looking at these monthly statistics, and Um, Something that I've highlighted that's in red is the daily average of individual people coming through here. That keeps growing. And now we're over 80. And we also realized that probably 80% or fewer actually use their card and sign in, right? So our numbers are really under-reporting reality. Um, And I would say so, because I remember about every third time. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, it's not it's no one's favorite activity to nag people about doing things like that so you know fewer people are signing in than than are coming in for sure but nonetheless i think we've got really impressive numbers and you know card swipes is what you know the the term for you know signing in while using your card so in january um so 236 individuals that's unduplicated um came through the doors and used their card Um, But people coming again and again and again, um, that's duplicated, was, you know, getting up toward 1,000, 938. So we really are seeing a growth in visitation, which I think is great. And I'm seeing, you know, larger numbers 
in, of people enrolling in classes and people are really you know jumping to be a part of art classes and certain kinds of things and lunchbox the lunchbox meal is really popular and and well appreciated Last week was excellent. It was the chicken pot pie and the beautiful dessert. Wasn't it amazing? Anyone who was here for that? Um, those are really special days. And um, just want to shout out to Susan Glowatsky, the lead cook, uh, who is also our town clerk. And, and, you know, just marvel at her generosity of time. And the um, human relations, is it Jennifer? Travato? Yes, Jen Travato is frequently is also a helper. So and the friends generally, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The friends generally. Well, we and we have a couple of volunteers who always uh, kind of yeah. take part in that. Diane mm -hmm. Tolfa, right? Mm -hmm. And um, she is a friend and also a member of the Friends organization, mm -hmm. as well as a very stalwart regular volunteer here. And Joanne Lecca um, does a lot of serving. Um, Nora Meyer, who is, you know, I call her in general kind of our lead kitchen volunteer who um, puts together a lot of, does a lot of the lunch prep. Um, Connie Fallis and Mert Tomeski, um, all, you know, everyone comes together and creates this really great experience and they make it look easy, but it is a lot of work. What's the um, 1646 total event sign in? Is that for everything? Select board, uh, the the use of the building, or is yeah, that... why is that different than total number of card swipes? Right. Oh, it's a good question. I have a question too. So, when someone brings a visitor, like a, a friend, how is that counted by the receptionist, or how, how do well, those people get counted? They they can question. sign in without a card as a guest. Okay. So that's the ideal way. Okay. Also, the receptionists are noting walk-ins. Okay. So that also, and you'll see that I think here, um, that they're observing. But you know, I gotta be honest, Linda, I'm not discerning the difference between total event sign-in and total number of card swipes. I'll ask Violet. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I'll and I notice also the the um number of volunteer hours. Volunteers so often do not record their hours. There have got to be many more hours there. Probably, and I and I and that's a number that I put into this, and that is from my senior center. So I'm not doing, mm -hmm. I'm not analyzing it. I'm grabbing what my senior center says that volunteers signed in for in the month. And so, I bet there's a lot more hours right. because people yeah. forget to sign in. Yeah, sure, they, they do. just come right. to the door and get to Or you're not even sure how many hours it's going to be. Than the reality is. May I ask another question? Just the format of this particular. This is a spreadsheet, right? Mm -hmm. And so I found, I couldn't figure out how to print it. Well, uh, I'll show you what I do. I, I have I have Excel on my okay. computer. But I'm going to show you on the screen. You want to look at the screen and I'll show you how? So you um, you select what you want to have printed. So that's the table. I know from experience that I should use um, the landscape orientation for this because I printed it for right. our friend, Len. So I know that it's going to need two sides and that it should be landscape. And then the next time you want to print something, you've got to remember to go back to portrait. <laughs> or that's or right. print it. <laughs> yeah. Landscape. Then, so go to file, go to print, and then that's what's going to print. So really, it's just a matter of selecting the cells that you want to be printed. Does that make sense? Um, Highlight, Control C. <laughs> well, no, I'm, well, I'm using my mouse, so I'm using my mouse, and I'm when going. I, when I got it, it, I didn't have the all that stuff. The, uh, the file and all that across the top. I didn't have that on mine. You may have an older right. So Excel. yeah, I, well, no, I because I sent you the document. Yeah, and I'm in and I'm in the program okay. right now. Okay. Can you can you eliminate these other cells? Well, yeah, I'm because I'm I'm eliminating them by only selecting the things I want to print. So they won't print. Those yeah. other cells won't right. print. Right. What? But I, I'm not it. eliminating them from the, for the exactly. purpose of this We're document did you get existing. This done? Is it what you got? Just looking like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, did you do enable editing? Editing. 
Do what? In, in your, oh, yeah, the computer class. And so then all that would be yeah, so do you, yeah. Yeah. Edit. Yeah, I, I know what you told me. Right. About. Enable that. I thought I clicked it, unless that is clicked. Not. That's a good point. So, again, so go back to file, print, and you will see. And then here's where you do landscape or portrait. Yes. So if it's yeah. portrait, no, I knew that it wasn't going to get it all. And I yeah. go to landscape and I see that it will capture it all. There you go. Well, I have a, another question. Mm -hmm. So is it worrisome that people aren't signing in? Does that affect like reporting or statistics or, or anything? Well, it affects the accuracy of our statistics. It does. And I would rather, it's, it's worth the effort to remind people to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not making it the sword I die on. Sure. Um, and I do, and I think that there's sort of a notion of, how hard it is to track with total accuracy what oh. goes on in a place like this that's sure. understood by the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Mm -hmm. But I use these statistics for, for these monthly meetings. Mm -hmm. I used it, so from my senior center, which is our database, which is where all these numbers are coming from and all your sign-ins show up in that, um, the, I use them for, for this sort of monthly snapshot for you all. I use it for the exec, my annual report for the Executive Office of Elder Affairs uh -huh. And I use it to, I used it probably, I, I use it for the finance committee when I'm presenting my budget to say, look, we have mm -hmm. growing participation. It can help me make a point. Mm -hmm. It can, I can, I can give them a clear indication of the many things that go on here that otherwise I don't think members of that committee are going to have a clear idea. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not people who come here every day and really see it. So I rely on this data to demonstrate need and demonstrate that we have a vibrant, okay. multifaceted set of things happening. And so it's probably a small percentage of people that forget or don't sign in. Is that your sense? Um, Just wondering. Small percentage. <laughs> I We're thinking about 20% okay. are not doing it. That is a True. guess. I really don't know. Um, I, I, I very frequently see people doing it. Like mostly I, I see people. At, yeah. And, you know, so if you ever feel emboldened to to mention to someone that you see breezing right by like hey can you sign in it really helps us you know yeah. feel free but it's not always comfortable to do that and yeah. I'm not expecting you to be the sign-in police uh -huh. I mean I'm not willing to be the sign-in police and I'm not willing to assign that to anyone it does demonstrate usefulness of this of, of the senior center to the town yeah so, so that's that's the most compelling thing like mm -hmm. this helps us make the argument that this place uh -huh. is vital and that this place is serving a lot of people. Yeah. I don't know if that we have to make that argument anymore. It's so obvious. <laughs> but, <laughs> Seems but that the way. numbers are important. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> right. I um, mean, I keep thinking about different things that I could add to this list. Like this doesn't really give you any sense of the work that Lauren does as an outreach coordinator. You don't. Oh yeah. You don't know how many deep social service based conversations she's having and how many referrals she's making and how much hard work she's doing to um, serve people who are um, experiencing some kind of a need or a problem. So that's another large dimension of the work that happens here and it involves me. She doesn't um, keep a record? Of she does. I just, I haven't, it hasn't been gotten pulled out for this report um, and maybe it could, it could, and so I could figure out a way to include, say, the number of outreach-based appointments that she has in a week or a, a month. So, you know. Include yours, too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so maybe we can do more to explain that. Just... <laughs> she did. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're busy. There are crises, and I, I kind of even, like, we can't get into the details of them, but we're almost always in the midst of, being involved with an in, a high needs individual who has a series of unsolvable problems. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be frank. Um, there is a housing crisis in this community, and 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 not just Hadley, but the, the entire mm -hmm. really I think the country, mm -hmm. but definitely Massachusetts. Um, there are undiagnosed mental illness issues that prevent people from being able to avail themselves of different kinds of resources and getting help. 
There's the stigma that protect, prevents people from admitting that they've got a problem. Mm -hmm. There is hoarding disorder. There are, you know, there are a lot of problems that are, you know, tend to be lumped in with older adults that aren't specific to older adults, but nonetheless um, can be kind of reach the fevered pitch of crisis for older people. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say for over a year, we've had, we've been constantly aware of at least one person, you know, on the brink of being homeless. Not to mention evictions. There are evictions. right, and that's what right. I include mm -hmm. that. So, you know, we we do have crises that are kind of always simmering that are that aren't really reflected in what I've shared here, and I can find a way to convey that. Um, and I think I need to increasingly find a way to convey that to my colleagues in town hall. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important yeah. because you and Lauren do a lot of work that's like the, the, the underneath the right. subterranean. Yeah. Right. Right. A lot right. of right. invisible. Mm -hmm. work a lot of phone calls and a lot of interdepartmental meetings i hadley is really trying to come together interdepartmentally to try to solve these problems but what solving the problem looks like sometimes is not agreed upon um so we you know we have it's it's deep and difficult work but i'm grateful to do it and feel like even when i'm done with a hard conversation and i still don't really feel closer to the answer i feel good that we had the conversation so that's happening. Yeah, it seems like a, in addition to presenting stuff like this, it's important for you to always make the statements that you just made, right. that, that that the numbers don't totally convey what goes on. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And, I, you know, it's what we're doing is really qualitative as opposed to quantitative. I mean, it is quantitative and I do my best to, to present information like that, but um, there's kind of a depth of involvement that's difficult to put on paper. Um, so, and, you know, there's sleepless nights. <laughs> so where, where is where is Lauren's services? Where is that? They're not here. Oh, they're not. You know, she, that's she, what we're saying that we yeah, think she should be. Yeah. What she is reporting on is transportation because in addition she to being that. our outreach coordinator, she's our transportation coordinator. Right. Um, but I, you know, now I'm thinking we really should include another line of a few different statistics that indicate with more clarity what she's doing. Yeah. Yes. Like the yeah. home, if he does home visits. And, or... Yeah, home visits. And I think you should all know, for example, how many people living alone with advanced dementia that we're trying to help. Um, right. This And this, and I will tell you this, too, that this is the impetus and the, the, the motivation for starting a companion volunteer program. I mean, I really feel like the unsolvable problems around isolated people living alone in their home, home visits aren't going to solve all their problems, but I truly believe that that human connection is going to make in the moment living better. I found out, I don't know if you want, if this is the right place or time, but I found out a lot of information yesterday afternoon about a um, nearby companion programs well we do have until noon and we're just about at the end of our agenda so i would welcome hearing from linda about what she's learned about other communities and their companion programs are we okay with that mm -hmm. it's off the agenda but you have does anybody know that you went to the select board twice and got the approval is that even on here no you didn't mention that my goodness, what a terrible omission. <laughs> All right. Let me just mention this one thing, and it's quick. The, so um, our age, Hadley's Age and Dementia-Friendly Community Assessment and Action Plan was officially uh, approved by um, the select board last week. Um, the, in two weeks before that, yay! Hey, hey, hey. I know on the 18th, you, you, start, you started talking to them about it on the 18th of January. And so you have two different meetings. Right, we had two meetings. So yeah. there was one meeting to introduce to to give yeah. them the document really and say, please read this and think about it, and can and and we would we're going to ask you to adopt it. And this to, and this is what adoption means, which is that you apply an age friendly lens to policy decisions and you give thought to how all of these decisions affect older specifically affect older adults, right? So put on. You know, put on, well, put on your age friendly glasses and think, how does this affect older people? Wow, I really, I feel weird about how I, maybe, maybe you are worried about what happens if a low income housing development comes in near you, but maybe you can see, you can open your heart to this idea if you consider the fact that that would help um, vulnerable older adults in Hadley who don't have other options. 
you know, how, how do you how do you begin to align your values around having Hadley be a place that is welcoming and where people can age in place and live as long as possible? Um, so that that's really what we asked them to consider. And they and so they did adopt the assessment and action plan. And that's great. Um, that was a culmination of over a year and a half work. It, it really was. And so now and now we're also going to be submitting some documents to the MCOA's dementia-friendly network to get on the map as a dementia-friendly community. And that is another reason that too has motivated me to, and Linda, um, to, to understand what it would take to have a volunteer companion program. Um, and so with that in mind, um, Linda, who is also a senior tax workoff employee, um, has spent some time being in having conversations with other COAs that are doing this or doing something like it. And maybe we're fine. And maybe you found out that it's nothing like what we thought, but I'd like to hear what you learned. Well, um, there's been a lot over the last month with age um, and dementia friendly stuff going on from um, research um, to finding out about other programs to research about how businesses are, how businesses can become champ dementia champions to, but the companion program <clears throat> I was really interested in specifically what Cindy Sullivan had to say in Westfield. Um, okay. Um, I'm sorry, Southwick. Cindy and Sullivan in Southwick? Southwick. Okay. And they have a companion program. She was so kind. She sent me all of their forms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> and a brochure and You're descriptions of what they do. Yeah. And um, she's very excited about the program. They actually started it with a small grant from a local grant giving organization in around Southwick. Um, and they are going to banks in the Southwick area asking for um, funding for the companion program as well. So they're, they've only been doing this for less than a year. And a lot of that was getting up and go, getting structure. And, yeah. And and building it, the legal kinds of things they needed. Oh, one of the things that they needed was um, to get a revolving account with the town, mm -hmm. specifically because of the way they are they've structured their program, not because we have to. Mm -hmm. But um, and then creating the vetting forms and the application forms and the matching client to, to uh, volunteer forms. Basically, what it comes down to, and it's nitty gritty, is finding volunteers who can match the needs of clients with need. And it could be something as simple as um, you just volunteering to sit with a particular person for an hour a week to talk with them and play card games or something. Right. And that's one volunteer thing. But to have you do that, we have to vet you and train you. I'm interested in yeah. how they're trained and if there are existing programs that exist. A manual. Ah. Got a manual. Training manual. <laughs> That's in here. <laughs> yeah, they have something for everything. But uh, another example of what they do is uh, to take transportation, which we have a separate, you know, situation for transportation. But they will have somebody who volunteers to drive a particular client to 10 or 12 cancer visits. Wow. Okay. And they might yeah, not, that's a different way to slice and dice that. That's a different way to slice and dice it. And and sometimes they need two people to do all those 10 or 12 visits, but they do pay the volunteers mileage. Mm -hmm. So that's where their revolving account comes in. Yeah. They actually bill the client for that transportation. Ah. And then they the client pays or the um, client pays the council, the, the mm -hmm. senior center, the senior center pays the volunteer. Okay. So they have that in and out. You know. Yeah. She said you would know how that works. I do. Yeah. And um they could have a number of different um one one, for example, um you might want to volunteer to take a a, a solitary individual out of their house once a week, maybe to a Christmas tree or dollar shop or you know, just to to get them out of the house. So they have, you know, clients. And clients can apply, but then there's a broadcasting the information about clients letting people know that there is somebody out there who might be able to help them through the senior center. And then having volunteers, recruiting volunteers to meet the client's needs. She expressed the real strong um, 
advice, really, really strong advice to get the client's needs first and then to find the volunteers to match them. Mm -hmm. So, or no, actually, it was the other way. Pardon me. It was the other way around. Get volunteers would be interested mm -hmm. and then search for clients. But both both of those things have to be done. Clients have to apply. Volunteers have to apply. Yes. So it's it's not an easy process. They have maybe five or six different companion groups set up now. and But they had to set those up after maybe three quarters of a year getting the program in place. So when you said five or six companion groups, do you mean paired volunteer and client? Yes. Okay. Five or six client companion groups. Pairs. That's pairs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's their companion group. She said they do work with Westfield on some things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I tried reaching um, Williamsburg because they have a brand new companion group, and I haven't connected with them yet. So. Okay. But that's what I found out Thank yesterday you. afternoon. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. That's really illuminating. And it's great that they shared all this documentation in their training manual because I've been wondering and thinking about training. And also wondering about if there is a way to train volunteers to help people at medical appointments so that, for example, okay, so if if you're in a wheelchair and you need to take our van, you really do need to have a companion with you because our van driver is doing a curb to curb service. It's not his responsibility and he's not insured to, I mean, he, he'll to, to, to wheel you in and out, which should not, which is a pretty, seems like a, a, a low risk situation, but things do come up. Um, and so companions of the pe person of the people in the wheelchair who need rides ride for free. I am wondering if we can also train people, if there is a means of a way to train people to help people with transportation needs like that and to do the physical assist. Um, I don't believe we would have the ability to train someone to do a transfer, say, from car to wheelchair. And that becomes risky. Mm -hmm. um, but you see all of these things. These are the needs that do come up and the needs that we do witness. And I do sometimes feel right now. Um, sadly, unable to help people to the extent to which I'd like to. And I, what I don't know yet is to what degree can we push, can we fill these needs with volunteers? Or are there simply things that volunteers cannot do from a liability standpoint and a training standpoint? She gave me, some of the forms she gave me, this was her, she cautioned about this. It's, it's a lot of more work than it appears to be. Yes. Because um, volunteers have to apply but then they have to be vetted. They have to have referrals, okay. references. References. So not only a Corey check, mm -hmm. and I happen to know who they are, and I think they're great, but mm -hmm. they, they have to have references that. and they have to have skills that match mm -hmm. some needs. They also have to sign so that's a big job. confidential agreements and service agreements. And then there's the um, application of the client, which has a two-page assessment of what their needs are. So, and yeah, well, I'm. I sounds like you really... She said everything they have. You had a gold mine. You know, you talked to a good person and she gave you the right details. Yeah. I knew I was um you have simplifying all it in my mind. Yeah. I'm not just I mean, I'm not yeah. like put off by this. I I you know, I, I still feel committed to the idea, but I think it's really important for us to understand the the details. It could be a wonderful opportunity, but it is a lot of administrative work. There's a, a big scope there. It is, yeah. it is, it is a lot, and I'm thinking exactly of the administrative work. It's um it's a yeah. job. It's a yeah. job. It is. Basically it is. And to grow it beyond right you know, four or five sets. Yeah. Um it gets even more complicated because if you're going to be paying volunteers for mileage, then you have all of those accounting right. situations. Then you have, right, and that is pesky yeah. for very little yeah. money, for right? Little so, like, money. you know, a whole process and a bunch of paperwork for $7.50. It was mm -hmm. 50 cents a mile. Okay. Oh, that's <laughs> it? It's supposed to, okay, the IRS reimbursement rate is higher now. That's what she said. Okay. They charge 50 cents a mile, which right. hardly seems worth billing, but... Yeah. You know, it's, it's but sometimes people are taking no... people to an appointment in Springfield, yeah, that's or true. Greenfield or Holyoke, and, the, and then it really too. Sorry, parking too. Oh, that's true, absolutely, and tolls yeah. and so maybe, all of that and stuff. maybe meals, depending. Mm -hmm. 
But she didn't mention those things, but I bet they are involved. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Highland Valley, I mean, don't they have companion programs or people who would do your grocery shopping or take you somewhere or things They like don't that? take yeah. anybody anywhere. They, oh, they, they do have home care workers who will come to your home and they could do shopping for you. Yeah. You give them money, yeah. but they will not, they can't drive clients. Okay. So that's the big difference here. I see. It's not at all. Yeah. It's not nearly in. It's a whisper of this. Right. So, and they have, I will also mention too that the home care last I knew, and it may have changed, but there were different, say, um, levels of, of training and, um, need that the home care workers represented. There might be someone who was specifically a, a companion who would not be doing any hands on care, who would not be cleaning the house who would just be spending time with that person. And that's more of the model that I had in mind for this. Mm -hmm. um, and we could keep it simple too. You know, we could decide that we're really simplifying what is provided and that the only thing we are interested in is friendly visiting. And we already do have a set of dri drivers who give people rides to medical appointments and that's working. So I don't necessarily want right. mm -hmm. to We also have models in town. Uh, I know in my neighborhood, we have two or three neighbors who check on a senior neighbor um, exchange books and talk about books. Uh, another group that they do um, crossword puzzles together. Um, you know, there's a whole range of activities that can be done senior to senior or volunteer to senior that don't involve, you know, all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Highland Valley, and it, so they have they have people who are companions. They have people who clean who can clean your house and go grocery shopping for you and do your laundry. And again. That they are, they're limited. They won't provide hands-on assistance, but they can do, they're making your life easier by doing a little, they might prepare your lunch, they might do a load of laundry, and they might vacuum, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in, a, in a bit of time that they have with you. And then the next level up is personal care, and they will provide, <clears throat> they will supervise your shower, or they'll be aware. They might not be in the bathroom with you, but they're going to be keeping an ear out and being aware and available for help if you need it and available to put and they will put their hands on you if you need it and they're trained to do it um, and they could help with toileting they can help with transferring so so personal care is the next step up and then there's home health aid which is yet another level of training for people who are more high needs and please remember though that this is all theoretical this it's this is supposed to exist, but it's not necessarily going to be the case that Highland Valley can find the exact right person to fit your need in your home in Hadley, Massachusetts. And this friendship kind of companion idea is not in not really in there. Well, the there. companion and, and the spending time with I mean, the ideal picture is that there's someone suited to the work who's in that role who has a kind heart and is going to be friendly and is going to engage even difficult or quiet or people, you know, people with advanced dementia, that kind of thing. Um, but I will say that as a care, I did sometimes see companion situations where the companion was like kind of a bump on the log and not and just kind of there, but not truly engaging with the client. Um, and that's not what we want to do. We want people who are in it for the right reasons, who will make every effort to pass the time in a pleasant, you know, engaging way with their client. But th thank you. I think this gives us a ton more to think about. And I had a feeling that we would be. She sent you, um, I don't know if you got them, but she sent you four or five emails with documents attached to each. Okay. And I well, printed them all and okay. I'll make a copy of the whole shebang for you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate that. That's really valuable work. Um. Okay, just kind of looking down at the COVID numbers, they're kind of in line with what we've been seeing for the last few months. Uh, I don't think we have any alarming spikes that anyone's been made aware of. Um, and is there anything, is there any unforeseen business that anyone would like to introduce? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just an update on the housing crunch. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I, I have something to add with that, yeah. too. As, as you know, uh, at the last meeting, I said I had nothing to report as far as I knew the, the work was done, but it just hadn't yeah. been final stamp put on it. And <laughs> I think I went home that day and found an email from Jim that said, yeah. 
the final report has been approved. Uh, but uh, at that same meeting where the select board approved your know, dementia program, um, Jim Max Muskie, the head of the town planning board and, and also the head of this production housing production committee presented to the select board that he needed their approval of the plan that had been developed uh, as the next step in a kind of a bureaucratic process. It has to get approved by the state and then then you've got a basis for applying for grants to do work and that kind of stuff. And so that one got a unanimous support from the select board too. Uh, of course, he presented pretty innocuous, you know, it, it's a big body of information about everything to do with housing and yeah, and right. Hadley. And the main thing is, of course, that we have to meet the 10% affordable housing uh, requirement, which we do with a couple of percentage points higher than that. But um, so there, it, it, it's a, it's, there's a lot of useful information in the report, among other things, you know, how much land in Hadley is agriculturally productive land or, or wetlands and stuff like that. So there isn't really, even though there's a lot of open land in Hadley, there's not very much open land that's available for housing. I am shocked yeah. by that map. Yeah, it, yeah. The, the tiny dots yeah. of developable land. Yes, it's, exactly. It's, 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 exactly. It's very, very small. And he also so made the point that the town already has the requirement that, that for developers of of uh, like the East, East Street Commons, Barry Roberts development, uh, mm -hmm. there's a requirement that you have to, I guess, have 10% uh, affordable housing, but the requirement can be met by making a contribution to a, a town fund, not by actually building 10% affordable housing. And it right. probably probably wouldn't mm -hmm. make much sense with the style of that development to uh, stick a, a little shack in the middle of it and say this is affordable. It wouldn't be very helpful either to the neighbors or, or to the person living in that affordable house. But but the, the long and the short of it is that that the, the fund hasn't really produced much affordable housing. And uh, and one of the interesting statistics in that was that the median or average income, I don't know which arithmetic figure, but is higher in Hadley than across the state. Yeah. We, we're a higher income yes, town. Which has been... Yeah, which makes affordable housing... Which is when we were trying to look at money for the senior center, that didn't help us very much. Right. <laughs> You're in a high income because all the places like Chicopee and Holyoke, you know, they got big grants to help build this senior centers that we couldn't get anything like that because Hadley was considered a wealthy community, <laughs> even though it, it, it really... Yeah, so affordable to, affordable to Hadley is a much higher uh, rent or mortgage than affordable elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so anyway, yeah. there's going to be a presentation here in the senior center. Yeah, I, I proposed this to Jim that yeah. night. Is it, it March 8th? Is that the right day? Yeah, well, let's see. I, and yes, it is March 8th at 7 o'clock here at the Senior Center. They'll do a presentation of the housing production plan. And is it also going to be, is it a hybrid thing with Zoom too? That I don't know because I'm not organizing the meeting. Yeah, I'm just You know that it. last round, it was going to be a hybrid one and then it ended up just being straight Zoom. Yeah, well, that's up to those organizers, but it's happening in person here. Yeah. Um. Wednesday, March 8th at 7 o'clock, they're presenting this plan. And this I just brought up the map of... Yeah. Developable, yeah, a developable land yeah, in Hadley, and, so, yeah. and um, so much. those are the kind of like top sort of orangey, orange colored squares, and you see how few there are and yeah, how tiny they are. Not much of anything. Yeah, it's. I was, I was definitely taken aback by that. Yeah. Um, and potentially developable, developable. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting. What are the conditions for potential? Right, developable is a hard word to say. 
Um, but this is, I think this is, this is going to be an ongoing Hadley conversation. And I, I feel that senior center supporters and people who are concerned about aging in place in Hadley should be part of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and certainly the, you know, there was that letter in the Hampshire Gazette not too long ago, written by some person who didn't live in Hadley. Right. I saw but that. he singled out Hadley to make the argument that we need a lot of changes in zoning rules to uh, permit more affordable housing to be developed. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the the the, uh, the higher income type of housing takes care of itself. You know, there's a market for that, and the developers are happy to to uh, supply that market with with buildings. But affordable housing is a is another ball game altogether, and, and particularly if you want to put two houses on a piece of land which currently is owned for only one piece of house. Uh, and there, I understand there are a number of obstacles to, to putting two houses in addition to zoning. It's also um, the town infrastructure, particularly sewer, is set up for one line per house per lot. You know, that's yeah, the town no. code. Right. So I that's, think that's accurate. I'm not positive. But. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I'm happy that we can support the process with hosting a presentation here. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for your service of being on this group. Yes. Yes. They thank you. Really um, important work. And I feel very supportive of it. And um, I would also encourage you all to read this report. And um, if you need a printed copy, I can make you one there. It's what about 40 pages? It's a, it's a long one. <laughs> you know, it's our, I our put my home printers to a test. <laughs> it's on the town website. I don't know if this is on the town website. Ours is on our website. Okay. Um, but this one, and this is not, you know, we didn't prepare this. So this is a little over 30 pages. Um, but it's very informative. Yes. They did a really great job. Yeah. Sadly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is an important gift for Hadley to have to head and to... It's going to be tricky. Yeah. We don't know, but anyone who would be interested, a developer would be interested in putting in like a affordable, a senior housing units in one of those big orange areas. Well, like I said, the, the, the most of the developers are, are very happy to be producing for... Yeah, things like East Street, Commons. like the East Street Commons, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, is a, too, which is a nice uh, development, but it doesn't do really anything for affordable. And of course, uh, again, this uh, this thing with the um, the hotel on Route Nine, the Econo Lodge. Yeah, I, I don't know what the current status of that is, but you know, I think it's probably going to be for homeless people. Well, it, they have asked that it be temporarily used as a homeless shelter overflow for Craig's doors. Um, and I do not know if that use is active right now. And it would be temporary at any rate because they the plan is to develop it as studio and one bedroom apartments um, for low income people. And there would also be a property, an on site property manager who lived there so that there's a. Yeah someone fulfilling a social services role too because i think that there would be some high needs tenants that needed some support um i don't i and i think there's a way to go before that also yeah, is approved at, i feel like it's time, been proposed thought, oh boy, that's going to be at, yeah as proposed there are quite there are a number of units that are affordable really low income affordable you have to meet a low income and then there are going to be a small number of homeless service units. In other words, they're not just housing them, but providing on-site services. Right, so supported housing, supported housing. services. Yeah. yeah. Which, and I will tell you that from my perspective, that is exactly what's missing here right now. Yeah. Um, but it's not a popular idea to everybody. It's, there, there will, this is a controversial topic and there will be, definitely there's oh, opposition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering what's the next iteration of this proposal from Valley CDC. They're the owners, right? They did buy the Econo Lodge. Am I right? They do own it now? I, I 
I guess I can't so. talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Will it be? And I know that the zoning board is learning, and other town officials are learning more about 40B developments. We had to have a training. Mm -hmm. I was an hour and a half long with the town attorney. It's a really complicated situation, which I can't talk about. Okay. So I don't know the next public opportunity for people to be learn more. Um, well, there will be a number of hearings, at least two of which will be open public comment. Mm -hmm. um, By the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board or both? The Zoning Board of Appeals has the whole load. Okay. Planning Board, and there'll be a hearing, as I understand it, a hearing where there's a presentation made by the applicants. Um, maybe at the same time or a different time, the planning boards will ask questions and give planning, select board, all the boards and town departments can ask questions and give input. There'll be one or, one or more public hearings where people can ask questions and comment from Hadley and surrounding areas. Um, well, you will be able to give us advance notice of the Zoning Board of Appeal meetings that have public comment opportunity. Yeah, and they'll be they have to be prominently posted in a lot of places, okay. including the town website, the mm -hmm. um, town hall, um, probably the Gazette. Um, it should be pretty well publicized, okay. I think. Yeah, I keep I think keeping an eye on this project mm -hmm. is the most direct way that you know, anyone interested in promoting this or, you know, really the, whatever your opinion is about it, I think that people have perspectives, is, you know, on it from all different sides. It's right. complicated. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of things to take into consideration. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sorry to omit that, David. Thank you for updating us. Okay. So with that, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Seven. 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 <laughs> <laughs>